dames en heren, een heel hartelijk welkom bij de Bali. Ik zal nu uh, mijn verhaal uh, voortzetten in het Engels, daar we een uh, Engelse spreker ook vanavond hebben. Ladies and gentlemen, a mo most warm welcome here at the Bali. We are very delighted that we have such a full audience and we are very delighted with the presence of Mr. Professor Ian Robertson, Mr. Um, Jeroen Smit, Rob Oudkerk en Stine Jensen. Um, this evening is in cooperation with Maven Publishing, is a renowned publishing house here in the Netherlands, which has 10 books a year about social behavior and all the new insights. Tonight we're going to talk about the winner effect, the effect of failure and the effect of success and the most dramatic changes when leaders in power uh, have too much power perhaps. Uh, the moderator of the evening, are, we are very welcome, uh, happy that he is here tonight, Mr. Jeroen Smit. Jeroen Smit is a very well-known uh, investigating journalist who has written two books you probably all know of. They, they are about the Ahold scandal and ABN AMRO. He has investigated the leaders Rijkman Groening and Kees van der Hoeve. And basically the outline of the books of uh, Mr. Smit are a little bit about the results of Robertson itself. They uh, had a lot of power, a lot of control, and they lost it. I would like to welcome here Jeroen Smit Thank and a much. warm welcome to the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to moderate this evening about the vices and virtues of leadership. Ah, I wanted to... <laughs> well, he lost it. Did you see it yesterday evening at Knevel and Van der Brink? Did you look into his eyes? Oh, he was really searching. Eh? He's gone. It's over. It's finished. Um, I'm intrigued by this topic, as Inik already mentioned, especially because I'm convinced that the leadership, as we know it, is all about winning, about the market. Whether, to, whether it's politics or business, it is a survival of the fittest. And I'm also convinced that this kind of leadership has to make room for more empathic leadership, which focuses on cooperation instead of on... <laughs> right. Perfect timing. Um, <laughs> he doesn't agree with me, obviously. Um, but anyway, I'm convinced we need more empathic leadership focusing on cooperation and on, instead of competition. Um, I quote from Ian Robertson's book, I love the book. The current crisis is the result of too much testosterone in the bankers' brains, which shattered their, morale, co the mor their moral com compass and left the um, ego-driven focus on more uh, money and power, uh, and, and left them with uh, ego-driven focus on more money and power. I have this fantasy, ladies and gentlemen, about bankers, about leadership, that really feels a responsibility for the environment uh, he or she has to operate in. Really feels responsible for the environment. For the environment itself, for the morale, other things. Um, after reading Ian's book, I worry. It's not going to be very easy. Winning, beating the others, it has deep, deep roots in our biological systems. We are all products of the environment we live in. There's not much we can do. On the other hand, Robertson also sheds some light here and there, we're going to explore them this evening, on possible ways to achieve a more balanced leadership. Yes, more women, for example. Well, we're going to discuss it. Hopefully, you'll have some suggestions here as well. And some things are very simple. Very simple. He, he quotes many different uh, researchers, and they did all kinds of research. Uh, and one of those researchers is about color, using color. Anybody in red tonight? I wear red. Well, this is the most, the most, well, this is red for me. I don't have a truly red shirt anyway. This is more or less red. But red is okay. Research shows that um, um, they did some research on the Oli Olympic Games, not the recent one, but the, the, the games before on the Olympic Games. And uh, if you wear a red shirt in the Olympic Games, teams carrying red shirts won 60% of the games. If you carry blue, anybody with blue, you're a loser, I'm afraid. <laughs> If you carry a blue shirt, the odds are very different. They win only 38% of the game. So some things you can easily change, carry on wear, uh, wearing uh, red. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's hope we have an inspiring evening. I know for sure we will. We'll have a wonderful forum. I'll introduce you, I'll, I'll introduce them to you later. Uh, but first, I want, to give, um, I want you to, have, uh, to give a big hand to the, the main guest tonight, neuropsychologist and writer of Winner Effect, How Power Affects Your Brain, Ian Robertson. Thank <laughs> you. 
Guten Abend. Danke well. Zwei Bier. That's my only Dutch. I'm sorry. Um, it's a great thank you. It's such an honor to be here. I would like to thank um, uh, Sander and his colleagues from Maven Publishing and Jeroen and uh, all the other colleagues from the ba Bali here who have made this such an interesting and won wonderful uh, forum. Uh, stimulating, interesting. I'd love to see something like this where I live. So I'm going to talk, as Jeroen so kindly introduced, about the winner effect. I'm going to start with a mystery about fish. You must have think I've got something about fish, but it's a mystery of the cichlid fish. Now, the cichlid fish lives in Africa, in Lake Tanganyika, among other places. And the, the males of the species come in two forms. The top one is the NT fish, and the bottom one is the T fish. They're both the same species, they're both males, but one is the NT in the top, and the bottom is the T fish. Now, the NT fish is identically colored to the females, not brightly colored. He's a very submissive fish who skulks with the females and tries to avoid the T fish, who are brightly colored dandies, strutting their stuff, sexually attractive and sexually prolific. Um, the gonads, the gonad producing, the gonad uh, neurotrophin in the brain, it, the cells producing that are 12 times as big in the T fish than the NT fish. And the T fish is highly fertile and the NT fish is infertile. So you might see the Darwinians among you uh, and I'm a Darwinian, uh, we all have to be. But the extreme interpreters of Darwin might say, ha, this is what we should have in the human species. Isn't it right that the inferior members of this species should not reproduce because they are biologically inferior? This is, isn't this selection that it's natural, mu random mutation, natural selection at its best? And we do have a few extreme people saying that kind of thing about human beings. The poor should not. There's a great problem. We're diluting the genes of the race by the poor breeding too much. We've heard this kind of story all around the world. But I'm not a eugenicist. Because, and one of the reasons I'm not a eugenicist is because sometimes a remarkable thing happens to the anti fish. Sometimes... In a matter of hours, less than 24 hours, the NT fish changes into a T fish, becomes beautifully colored, becomes sexually attractive suddenly. The female fish are flocking to him. He starts to bully the other NT fish. His gonads swell to 12 times the size and he becomes fertile. What? on earth has happened? Is it some kind of menopause, reverse menopause? Is it a change in the temperature of the lake? No. But I'll come back to that mystery towards the end of the talk. I want to talk about power. Can, can the men among you, just raise your hand like this and clench your fist for a moment. Okay? Just do that for 30 seconds. <laughs> just the men. Just the men. This doesn't work with women. <laughs> okay, put them down. Your testosterone levels have just increased significantly. <laughs> women, you're on to it! <laughs> However, if I can get all of you, men and women, to engage in a power pose, could you spread yourself like this? Just spread your arms, lounge back in your chair. Yeah. Imagine you're, imagine you're uh, prime minister, you know, who's just won the election. Okay, you've all raised your testosterone, men and women, if you hold that pose for a minute, okay? 
So adopting a, a power pose raises your testosterone. So when you see the boss of the company lounging back on the boardroom table while the, the trainee accountant is sitting crouched at the table, you can be sure the testosterone is up in the boss and down in the accountant. These are primitive biological facts, and I'm going to explain why that is important in power in a moment. Now, I'm going to set you a question. Can any of you think of a boss, either your boss or the boss of someone else you know about, in whom, you, whom um, power went to his or her head? There's a Dutch phrase, uh, what is it you told me, Sander? Someone told me there's a, a drunk with power. So what? Drunken for macht, yeah, with power. Drunk with power. Can you, yeah, is that right? Yeah. So, can anyone put up your hand if you can think of a boss who was affected by power in that way? Okay, good. That's fairly typical for audiences. Now, I want you to think, did these things apply to that boss? Uh, pushy. Pushy is an English word meaning very forward and forceful. So put up your hand if that's applied, yeah? Yeah. Selfish. Yeah, just keep putting up the hands. Likes having an impact on underlings by shocking them, surprising them, frightening them, or making them grateful. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Sees others in terms of their usefulness to them. Yeah? Yeah. Tunnel vision. Yeah, oh yeah, okay. Sexually primed? Yes. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> There's always one or two very loud female voices come from that one. <laughs> bullying and incompetent. Can anyone think of any bullying and incompetent? Okay. I'll come back to that one. Or these, hypocritical, applying different standards to themselves than to others. Yeah? Difficulty in seeing others' points of view. Yeah? Disinhibited, for instance, insensitive, making would-be jokey comments that are not really funny. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, these are all documented effects of power on mental function in a series, a wide series of experiments that I can't possibly document, done by very clever colleagues in the United States, Holland, a lot of them in Holland, and in England, showing even temporarily manipulating power in people's minds produces characteristic changes of this type. Um, and I think we can recognize that it's likely that real power over long periods in the real world certainly in some people produces these characteristics. So I want to try and explain a little bit tonight how that happens. On the other hand, how many of you can think of a boss who, when promoted, seemed to develop a strategic vision, able to see the wood better than the trees? Can anyone think of anyone like that? Not many. I can think of one. Decisive and goal-focused. With a, a healthy appetite for risk. Who able to handle stress well. Smart, sharp. Upbeat, positive, optimistic, bold, inspiring. Because these are also consequences of power. Power is not bad. Power evolved. Uh, our responses to power evolved because we are a group species. And groups need leaders. And so leadership is stressful and tough and difficult, as well as enjoyable at times. So it makes sense that there is a drug which makes you better as a leader if you become a leader. And so power makes you more abstract in your thinking. It makes you more optimistic. It's, it's a bit of an antidepressant and an anti-anxiety drug. It, um, it, it, it actually makes you more uh, goal-focused and therefore more optimistic and visionary. So that, this is the charisma aspects of leadership and power. But there are all these downsides as well. So how does this happen? So 
This is Bob Diamond. He uh, was chiseled out of Barclays Bank recently. Um, uh, he was... Here we have one of his quotes from last year, about a year before he, was, he left. He says, Culture is the critical element in responsible banking, and the best test of how it is, how people behave while no one is watching. So this was in 11th of August 2011. Here is um, Sir Mervyn King, the governor of the Bank of England, talking about the banking sector. Excessive compensation, shoddy treatment of customers, mis-selling, and the deceitful manipulation of a key interest rate flourished in the banking sector. And Bob Diamond was one of the key people from Wall Street who was involved in uh, determining the culture of the banking se sector. So here we, see, here we see the difference between you know, actually what was going on and what was being preached. That's hypocrisy, and power increases hypocrisy. Here's the, just a few week, couple of weeks ago from the British Parliament's Treasury Committee report. Mr. Diamond's evidence, at times highly selective, fell well short of the standard that Parliament expects, particularly from such an experienced and senior witness. Here we had a problem, not just of Bob Diamond, but of the whole banking sector. And, and Jeroen has written books about this in, in long before I ever came to this. Um, and we have to try and understand what's happening. The, you Dutch were very clever in selling ABNM AMRO to, to a, a clever Scotsman. <laughs> who came from the same city as me, Sir Fred, now Fred Goodwin. He was stripped of his knighthood. And um, here is what, uh, uh, after he had bought ABN AMRO, here is what um, was said. Some of our investors think Sir, Bed is a, Sir Fred is a megalomaniac who cares more about size than shareholder value. value. That was a Dresdner, Kleinwart, Wasserstein um, uh, analyst. It was as though he was saying, the emperor has no clothes. We all knew that, but no one dared say it. This is a problem of power, because power emboldens. Power increases aggression. Power is a primitive creation of dominance. And that creates submission in those who are under that power. And hence you get the boards of the banks and the regulators who were intimidated by the primitive dominance hierarchies of those in power. So, um, let's go to a more cheerful subject. This is um, uh, Chelsea uh, Football Club beating, against all the odds, Bayern Munich in the European Championship final a few months ago. And you'll see the classic power pose that you all you raised your testosterone with. And here we have a <laughs> classic submission pose. And these are... These are wired into us. This is part of our whole organization as, as, as groups. Now, here we have another football match, World Cup final between Italy and Brazil. And some American researchers in Atlanta, Georgia, did a very clever thing. They found a group of Brazil fans and a group of Italian fans, and they went and took saliva samples before the match and after the match. What did they find? This is among the fans. They found that testosterone levels went up in the Brazil fans and down in the Italy, Italy fans. So multiply that by millions and you possibly have the biggest ever chemical change experiment on human body ever made. 100 million Brazilians watching the match, 50 million Italians. You had engineered their testosterone in enormous ways by the simple vicarious winning or losing of their teams. Because winning, in both men and women, raises testosterone. Now, that has important effects. John Coates at Cambridge, just in 2008, before the Lehman's crash, studied a group of traders in the city of London. And he measured their testosterone every morning at 11 o'clock. And he found that on days when the testosterone was higher, they made higher profits. So testosterone increased risk-taking and increased profits, certainly in a bull market. So you can see the self-reinforcing aspects of that because 
with the, 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 the profit, the win of making a good profit would further increase the testosterone. And how does that have effect on the brain? Well, testosterone changes a fundamental chemical messenger in our brain called dopamine. And dopamine, whenever you get a pay rise at work, whenever you have sex, whenever you have a nice pint of lovely Dutch beer, whenever, if you, or if you ever have taken cocaine, all of these act on the same reward system deep in the brain, which is mediated by dopamine activity. So anything that makes us feel good, like a success or power, increases testosterone, which in turn increases dopamine. And dopamine changes your cognitive functions. It, makes, it influences the front part of your brain and makes you think more abstractly. It shifts your attention so that you focus on goals and optimistic forecasts and rewards, because it gives you rewards, so you want more rewards. And what does it do? It dampens down the other side of the brain, which is linked to noradrenaline, another chemical messenger, which is to do with threat and risk and worry and waking up at four o'clock in the morning thinking, oh my God, suppose Lehman's were to collapse. Okay? So what we had was the brains of the key regulators and bankers and financial uh, people had been systematically altered, biologically and physiologically engineered, such that they became blind to risk and focused on rewards and goals and more profits because of overstimulation of the dopamine reward system in the brain. Mike Tyson, three years in jail for rape, and he comes out. Uh, Frank Bruno is the world champion. What's he going to do? Well, boxing promoters in uh, America have known for a century what to do. Tomato cans. What are tomato cans? He's a tomato can. Tomato cans are pushover fights to give you a sense of winning. And what, here's another, what happened in the first fight he had after three years getting fat and sluggish in jail? 89 seconds. 89 seconds. It was a pushover. I mean, Neely was no match for him. He was the number two tomato can. <clears throat> Buster Mathis Jr. What happened to him? Now, it took three rounds to get him down, okay? But this is the winner effect, and the Don King and the American boxing promoters knew about this long before I ever did or any other scientist. If you want to get someone to win, give them an experience of winning. And here's the winner effect. Across species, the probability of winning a fight against a strong opponent is increased by previous victories against weaker opponents and have known this for centuries. How does this work? Well, you have to look to the California mouse. This is wonderful work by uh, Fuchs Jagger in Michigan. So the California mouse is a very feisty, competitive beast, particularly at home. And if you drug an opponent and he wins, the next fight he has against a non-drugged, strong opponent, he's more likely to win, simply by virtue, like Mike Tyson, of having beaten. Uh, that mouse. Mike Tyson went on to beat Frank Bruno and take the world championship in his third fight. That happens to the California mouse as well, if he has a victory or more than one victory at home. And that's because his brain has changed by the success. Uh, these androgen receptors, these receptors for critical hormones that are increased by uh, competition, are actually grow in the brain in critical motivation and aggression centers. So that when he has another fight a month later, <clears throat> and he gets another surge of testosterone in response to the, the contest, there are more receptors there to respond to the testosterone, testosterone, and so he gets a bigger hit. And he's more motivated, and he's more aggressive, and therefore that's the mechanism of the winner effect. 
It's not just mice, and it's not just boxers. <laughs> Ajax, uh, when they play at home, are more likely to win. All soccer teams, all teams are more likely to win at home. And this is not necessarily because they have a bigger crowd, although that helps. It's not because they're more familiar with the, with the, uh, the, the ground. That may help. It's because their testosterone is increased in a primitive way by the fact that they're on home territory, just like the California mouse. Okay. Um, Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell, who's his chief uh, aide, Tony Blair, uh, politicians and all people vary in their need for power. I only became aware of the existence of such a thing when for three years I had a job, I was, and it was a planned three, three years uh, job as Pro Vice Chancellor of Trinity College in Dublin. I was the Pro Vice Chancellor equivalent for research. It was called the Dean of Research. I had a lot of power. And I'd never heard about power or th thought about power's effect in the brain until one day I thought, you know, I have power, but I don't particularly get off on it. It doesn't do anything for me. But I had a colleague who was not, I'd appointed an assistant, and I told this to him, and he, he said he did enjoy power. I think he was the better person, or the better in the job than I was because of that. Because power, remember, is an antidepressant and an anti-anxiety drug. And I was very, I was, the leadership is tough and you're having to make decisions that affect people's lives. So if you don't have an appetite for power, you don't benefit from its um, mood-enhancing qualities. So we need people with an appetite of power. Tony Blair, as I'll show you in a little while, had a very high need for power, which can, you know, you, you, people don't recognize in themselves very easily because it's largely unconscious. But I think that his extraordinary behavior in going from what I thought was an excellent prime minister into this awful adventure in Iraq was attributable to the effects of having too much power for too long on his brain in a person with a particularly high need for power. Um, here we have Shinzo Abe, uh, who caused turmoil in the financial markets in 2007 by suddenly resigning as a Japanese prime minister without notice. It's the third largest economy in the world, and he resigned. And it was stress-related. He'd only been in the job about a year. We don't need uh, leaders. We don't want leaders who don't have the appetite, who are not going to benefit from the protective effects of power on their uh, state. Uh, and then we have Henry Kissinger, a great uh, exercise, some of the most terrible power in the bombing of in, Indochina. But... Um, he famously said, power is an aphrodisiac. And he's absolutely right. Here we have Muammar Gaddafi and his nurse. And, <laughs> and here we have Mr. Mugabe and his young uh, wife. And here we have the whole ridiculousness of dictatorship and of leaders who, are up, who gain power but for, but for whom there are no constraints. Because as, as Henry, I'm not talking about Henry Kissinger here, but Henry Kissinger was right to say it's an aphrodisiac because power upregulates dopamine. It increases appetites in general, including for sex, because sex acts through the same pathway. And that's why you have so much sexual activity among powerful people, because they're highly sexed as a result of the testosterone increases and the consequent dopamine increases. So the, the artifacts of democracy, uh, free press and independent judiciary elections, and you're going through elections now, these artifacts were invented by human beings because they recognize that the individual human being cannot cope with power unless constrained. But the bankers and the financial uh, masters of the universe with their boards that were so quiescent and just be, be, eyes dazzled by the profits and the bonuses, and the regulators who sat back and did nothing, um, 
they're there with the bankers and the financial leaders with no constraints of, on them. No constraints, no limits. And therefore, the power could have that big an effect on them. So I'm going to finish off. Sorry about this slide. This is just to come back if any of you want, if we, if we need to discuss the details of these. I did do um, a, 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 an analysis, which I have to um, just give you a, a kind of caution here. What we're doing here is we're taking three speeches from each of the three, these three leaders, uh, Wilder, Römer, and Rutte. And these are obviously speech writers have been involved in these speeches, but nevertheless, there is some aspect of these leaders' personalities in these speeches. And what we're doing here is using a method devised by David Winter and then Margaret, the great political psychologist Margaret Herman, and then implemented into an automated content analysis software by Michael Young, um, uh, his company, and uh, he kindly let me use this. And what this does is it's a, a library of language that analyzes word by word, and I can tell you how they do this if we have time after, the degree to which the leaders show particular types of motivation. Let's just focus on the second bottom one there, the need for power. Now, the need for power is defined as the percentage of verbs in the language that reflect actions of attack, advise, influence the behavior of others, concerns with reputation, and words like demand, refute, and advise. <clears throat> You'll see here that, um, that Tony Blair is the kind of refer reference. Zero is the average for a group of 51 world leaders. So these are this is, these are people with a high level of power. So this is a comparison with 51 world leaders. And you'll see the yellow line for, um, for so the, the purple line for, for um, there we go, for uh, Tony Blair here. Okay, switch this on, sorry. There we go, there we go, got it. Yeah, here's the Tony Blair. He, had, he, had a, he was in the top kind of 3% of world leaders for his need for power. Tony Blair also had a, a very abnormally high belief that he could control events, which he, how could you have anything else if you think you can change the world by linking up with George Bush to invade Iraq and change world politics? But interestingly for the Dutch politicians, the need for power, maybe not surprising, Mr. Wilder has a very, very high need for power. Obviously there are political slogans and political language in there. This is not a pure measure of his personality, but it is interesting to compare uh, Mr. Wilder with uh, uh, Mr. Römer and with Mr. Rutte, who actually has a need for power assessed in this way, which is lower than the, this group of uh, world leaders. They're all, maybe because they're in an election and they're not actually in power, they all have quite a high belief that they can control events, but um, uh, Interesting is their conceptual complexity. Uh, just, I'll just stop at this one. I'll just tell you what con con cognitive complexity. This is the percentage of words related to high complexity, e.g. approximately, possibly, trend, versus low complexity, absolutely, certainly, irreversible. And just if you do that simple, uh, you see that the, the most um, uh, complex, cognitively complex of them is Ruta and the uh, the, the, that um, Römer and Wilder would be more uh, simple in their language. Um, uh, that's, and then, of course, the in-group bias shouldn't be any surprise, except maybe Ruta's quite high on that, and um, the distrust of others is very you know, high there <laughs> in, in Mr. Wilder's. Um, they're, all, they're, all, they're all lacking in a certain um, task orientation. <laughs> <coughs> and... Um, uh, their self-confidence is a bit down as well, but uh, that's maybe because they have to be deferential because they're not yet elected. So I'm just about to finish. What's the mystery of the cichlid fish? What causes the change? It's not the menopause. It's not the change in temperature. <clears throat> lake Tanganyika, shallow lake, seagulls, fish down below, the bright fish are the easiest to see for the seagulls. So sometimes a seagull comes down, he's more likely to take a tea fish because he's a big swaggering dandy. 
he swallows him, and the tea fish is called a tea fish because he has territory. So the territory is suddenly vacant. And there's a little empty fish skulking about, and he goes, <gasps> so he jumps into the territory. And merely having that territory for a couple of hours causes this enormous transformation in this physiology of that fish. I believe similar things happen to human beings for good and for ill. So let me just give you one example of that. People who win an Oscar live on average four years longer than those who are nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> People who win a Nobel Prize live on average one and a half years longer than people who are nominated for a Nobel Prize. And this has nothing to do with money, because they're all equally wealthy. This has to do with the, to cut to the end of my argument, the protection of self. The protection of self that comes from the status of, I'm a Nobel Prize winner, I'm uh, Oscar winner. You could, the rest of us all the time were only as good as the last thing we did, the last thing we wrote, the last thing we, our job, or until our next appraisal at work. Once you've got uh, this, it's like it doesn't matter how well you do after that, yourself is guaranteed. And I think that one of the primary motivations for power is the protection of the self, the protection of the ego. And the more power you have, the greater, if we can think of it in this way, the more extended the ego becomes. And therefore, the greater the number of potential threats there are. So part of power's drive is this rather strange, and because the ego is a bit of an illusion, that strange enterprise to constantly try and protect your ego by constantly looking for threats, hammering down enemies, trying to get further. The, the praise you get is never enough because your ego has grown and therefore you need even grander things. So Gaddafi needed even grander uniforms, even more beautiful women, he needed a whole group of people, women protecting him. It's, it's a pathetic cycle that can never be fulfilled like drug addiction. Once you get into a cycle of addiction to cocaine or to heroin, the, the, the increasing tolerance means you can never achieve the same high except by escalating the doses. Power can act because it acts through the same systems as cocaine. Power can have the same effects, and it probably can become addictive as well. So, just like to finish off with, hopefully we don't know about medal winners, gold medal winners at the Olympics, but this great Dutch gold medal winner, I'll bet my quite a lot that his life is extended quite a lot by that wonderful achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bell. You say it's standing behind him. You say it there, yeah. Right, ladies and gentlemen. Before introducing the panel and the panel discussion and the statements, there's some room for questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Your questions are more important than mine. I do have a question to start off with, looking at the analysis based upon the three speeches which were analyzed, Rutte, Roemer, uh, Wilders, and uh, Blair. Um, the first thing that really strikes me is that all of them are low on self-esteem, uh, self-confidence. What, what, can you explain this to me a little bit more? How, you need some sort of, you would say like you need, you need to be self-confident in order to be willing to, to, to be a leader, to, 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 yeah. to sell yourself. Yeah, they well. All, all of them, they are low on, on, on self-confidence. Yeah. The four of them. Um, I, if you're going for election, you have to, if you're, the, the, Tony Blair was in power when this was done. Mm, okay. And this was his responses to parliamentary questions. So it's not that he's low in self-esteem, it's not that, he's more or less what a world leader should be okay. there. Uh, but if you're going for election, you have to ingratiate yourself hmm. with the electorate. This is, you, you, once you're in power for five years, you can bet that their self-confidence is going hmm. to up. I think okay. that's a feature of being in an election. I met, I met a professor at INSEAD, his name is Manfred Kessevries, and he studies leadership as well. And he says, all leaders are insecure overachievers. 
Well, there was a very interesting article in the New York Times yesterday about Barack Obama as an overachiever. Okay. Uh, that Barack Obama not, he's not content with being president. He has to make the best chili. He has to be the fittest. He said of his children... The best um, beer. Yeah. <laughs> make them win. He said of his children... Up, it was his advice to interns. Um, help your children rig things so that they win until they're one year old. After that, compete with them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sounds like a tiger mom, huh? <laughs> um, let, let, one more question about this. Um, it, it, really intriguing. Uh, it, talking about Rutte. So, Wilders is hungry for power. What's new? We know, uh, that's something we already guessed. Much more than Rutte. Uh, uh, but Rutte is even less power hungry compared to Rumer. And in, in the test I read somewhere, less power hungry compared to all the other, than 80% of the other leaders tested. Yeah. Yes. So, um, would you say, like, Rutte is half female? Uh, <laughs> well, the, 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 well, the thing is a compliment. The thing is, we are all wondering, I, I guess you do not know this, but Rutte has no partner. Oh, I didn't know that. And we don't know of a partner of Rutte. We've never ever seen a partner mm. of Rutte, whether he's male or female. He never discusses yeah. it. There's no, and it, it doesn't really bother me. But could there be, I mean, you're, you're a psychiatrist, half a psychiatrist <laughs> yourself. Maybe you could sort of help us out here, give us a clue. Is there a relationship between this behavior and this... His sexual appetite, which is not very clear? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You're talking to a man with a low need for power. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't... No, um, no I, I imagine my, my, my testosterone, average testosterone level is probably a bit lower mm -hmm. than someone with a higher need for power. I imagine that. And it does tend to go with sex drive. Yes. People who have... Men and women who have power have more sex yeah. on average, um, but we don't, we don't the, the, and the, if you have a gene that increases dopamine levels in your brain, the DAT1 gene, then you are more, you'll have more sexual partners. No, but I want to interpret, yeah. this is a compliment for Rutte. I, he, my, I didn't have time to go in. My response to what do we do about this, we need many more women in power. Okay. Um, and we need more men like Ruta in power. Okay, okay, okay. You need enough of an appetite for power that you don't get stressed for it. Okay. But you mustn't have too great an appetite for power. Okay. Questions? Please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. This is the opportunity. Yeah. You are? Uh, Tatiana. Tatiana. Um, I have a question about losers, which you didn't really touch on that. You said that winning can be conditioned. Does it mean that if you keep losing, then at some point you, there is no way out of that? Sorry, could you say that again? If you can be conditioned loser. If you keep losing, then Oh, at some if you point, keep losing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good... Thank so, if, yes. So, the NT fish are losers, if you like. The NT fish are losers. And as long as they don't get territory, they will stay losers, and there is, you're right, there's a positive feedback loop. My, again, my solution would be, and this is not original, but collective action, collective social action, collective political action, is a way by which people who are losers in the socioeconomic competition can get the, to escape the loser effect by solidarity. And I think that uh, communal uh, action, reducing the amount of ego-driven mm -hmm. uh, need for power and increasing the amount of motivation that people have for leadership that's for the benefit of a group, I think we will get better political systems if, if we do that. So it's not the case that there's a downward inevitable spiral for, for losers, but it's a big tough thing. If you're bottom of the socio-economic scale, getting out of there is an enormous barrier because you're combating the opposition of those who are higher up the scale to this. They need you down low. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. If you're one of those NT yeah. fishes, right? A super yeah. loser? Yeah. 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 Not fertile, nothing, nothing happens to you in your yeah. life. Yeah. You, you have no colors, there's nothing yeah. there. Uh, so why am I here? Big question. Loser number one. And then you're just swimming and then suddenly you're lucky because there's this T fish and yeah. he's been picked out by the seagull. Yeah. And you're just there yeah. at the moment. So there, there's the gap. Yeah. So losers can be lucky. Yes, they can as well. Just yes. fall in the gap. The yes. only thing you have to do is get over there and 
You Suddenly can, it happens within 20 hours. You can win the lotto. You can win the lotto. Yeah, yeah. It happens. Yeah. <laughs> it does happen. Okay. It's so right. thank you very much. You do sit down here. I'm going to introduce yeah. the other okay. members of the panel. Okay. Yes, yes, you can have a... Um, um, I'll introduce, uh, I'll ask the two members of the panel to, to sit down here in front immediately. Stine Jensen can have a big hand, philosopher, writer, TV, TV personality. She wrote two books, Dus Ik Ben, and, and now she wrote another book a couple of months ago, Dus Ik Ben Weer. Um, and then an, uh, a big hand for Rob Oudkerk. We all know him, former politician, doctor. And uh, at this very moment, he's both teaching and an entrepreneur. Just to, to introduce you a little bit more, uh, Stine, um, this second book again is about Wie ben ik, eh? uh, who am mm -hmm. I? It's about identity, but this time it's focusing on power. For instance, yes. Money, mobility, media, communications. Um, what is the main message of that book, if you compare what you've just heard with uh, Ian Robertson, from Ian um, Robertson? Well, the message of that book is that we have much less control than we think uh, about uh, in informing our identity. Uh, we think we have total control. Uh, who am I? Who, I, who do I want to be? What well, We have a huge economical crisis mm -hmm. and we now feel powerlessness much more. Look at Occupy, uh, the society is divided in the haves and the have-nots. Mm -hmm. So we have a much more sense of urgency that we need to do something about power balances. And in that sense, um, yeah, th this book, I, I can really advise it to everybody. It's, it's, it's probably the most female-friendly neuroscientific book I've ever read. <laughs> really. Again, again, again. Let's, can you repeat it's, this? It's the most female... Well, we, we are in this, this, this hype of neuroscience, brain, 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 brain. Yes, Dick Swap. Yeah. Dick Swap, but usually there's a conservative undertone. And this book, uh, it, you know, it says it's about tes testosterone, but look at the last analysis. It's language analysis. It's a language analysis. I love this book. And, the, and it's so progressive and free male friendly, but we will get to that. Okay. You all vote for the number twos on after all the political parties. After reading this book. Yeah. Thank you. They're all They're female. female. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rob Oudkerk, uh, um, uh, in 2005, uh, in your book, Geen Weg Terug, you suggested. Um, uh, hypothesis about the consequences of power, you suggested that power changes the chemistry in the brain. I'll quote you from the book. Being a powerful politician affects the chemistry in the brain, deforms the brain. You do things you normally, you not normally do, but you need to do them. You can only operate in the sixth gear. Sometimes you have no time or energy to be wise and you decide to follow your intuition. You think you can because you, are, you feel sort of invincible. In order to get rid of the excitement, adrenaline, you occasionally visited prostitutes. That's the, well, that's, um, yeah, this, this is the case, Rob. Uh, you, you, that's what you became very famous about, uh, with. Thank you very um, much. Yeah, yeah, by far. Yeah. That's your, yeah. that's You're your welcome. claim. You're that's, yeah, that's, that's face it, Rob, that's your claim to fame. I mean, it's, uh, it's, and it's a good story. It's a good story. Uh, I want to compliment you on the good story. You, you, you really... Uh, um, uh, so, but what I want to know from you, if, if you if you listen to to Ian to Ian Robinson, are you sort of relieved because he actually uh, sort of uh, um, uh, describes that something really happens in the brain that you are in a way a victim of uh, being a powerful uh, adrenaline addicted uh, politician? No, I'm not a victim because it's my own responsibility. Excuse me, microphone is not working. The is he working? Is he working? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's working. Well, again, I'm not a victim. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not a victim because it's my own responsibility to do things um, which I didn't do before and which I don't do now. But the first f four, five slides of your boss experience, <laughs> I recognized it. Mm -hmm. I was a my wife said to me, you were a terrible man. Um, you had no empathy. You thought you were invincible. You didn't listen to me, to your children, to all other people, even to friends. And when I look at it, it's, it's eight years later. So it's easy to look at myself now as I was in 2003 and 2004. Um, I don't recognize myself. Mm -hmm. I was frightened. 
after that. But when I was an elder man here, I really thought no one can do anything to me. I'm invincible. Mm -hmm. um, no one can hurt me. I can do whatever I like. Uh, I had an enormous sex drive. I had, well, all the testosterone and dopamine uh, streaming out of your ears. Yeah, yeah th that it was. Okay, but the interesting thing is, we were just we were just we just met, and you said, well, I'm comfortable, but. <laughs> I'm looking for a new <laughs> challenge. I need to, again, to feel the adrenaline. I yeah. So you've learned a lesson on one side, hey, a, a yeah. very personal uh, yeah. uh, lesson, uh, but also you miss it in a way. You miss the, the, the excitement? Um, well, it's double. The challenge? It, it, of course, it's double, but you told us um, uh, half an hour ago there are also a lot of positive things with power. Um, well, if you're addicted to power, and I'm not addicted, but I'm not completely free, then you like to have these things back again, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do right now, we have several statements, a handful. You found on your chair a green card and a red card. I want you to find those cards, <coughs> take them in your hands, and I will ask you um, after presenting a statement, whether you agree or disagree, obviously, red you disagree, green you agree, and maybe I will come to you with my microphone and ask you why you raised either the red or the green card. And then we'll get this, your reaction back to, the, to, the, to um, Stine, uh, uh, Ian and Rob. Clear? So, uh, I would like to start with the first statement. Um, and this is, this is something new. Uh, and intriguing. Uh, maybe, maybe, Ian, you should give us a little bit of an example here because, so, the, the statement is, future leaders, including the new prime minister, should be psychologically tested before they start their job. And the reason is, it is currently possible to accurately test the likelihood, the likelihood to develop power and success-related psychological problems, as we just saw in the uh, an analysis of the, the, the three speeches. How, but maybe you should add a little bit more there to explain to the people, what can we do? Can, do we have to put them in the machine, or is it a psychological <laughs> test? Hey, look at their brains, and th I mean, it is an interesting thought hey, to, to test them. The, the absolute best test would be to interview people who have been under the power of that person in previous roles. Oh, you would, okay, you would want to interview several people which were... Uh, 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 they were the boss of those people, so yes, they were, yes, they were uh, yes. employee or... Yes. Okay, being dominated by this yes. person. Now, this happens in some American companies already, where you get everyone assesses everyone else. Assessments, yes. Once a year. Now, I believe this happens in Microsoft, in Dublin anyway, and 10% of people who are at the bottom are let go. There's the ruthlessness. Thing. Yeah, okay. But that means in this, in where you have such constraints, it's very difficult to be a bullying boss okay. in such a situation. It I'm not advocating it. It's pretty, pretty tough. Okay, let's ask the audience. Let's raise. Mm. Well, if you agree, raise your green card. If you disagree, baloney, red. Let me see. It's all red. No, it's not all red. I'm going to ask. Almost everybody is red, but I see a couple of green cards. This lady over here. Yes. Explain to us why. Who are? What's your name? <coughs> My name is Alessandra. <laughs> uh, so um, I think it's. It's reasonable to have also a, a sort of, um, uh, well, measure of uh, personality mm -hmm. traits uh, of leaders and also how they uh, acted and uh, uh, previously, mm -hmm. uh, if they were in uh, uh, leader positions uh, with their, um, uh, with their, uh, yeah, employees, for example, okay. people that were under them. I think it's it's reasonable to have. It's a reasonable thing to ask. Is it's it a reasonable? And have a, a, a good, uh, yeah, a sort of uh, estimation of their, um, yeah, psychological traits, yeah, and personality. Okay. If somebody thinks it's really a, 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 not a very good idea, Baloney, could you raise your hand, please, and we, we could explain? Yes. Why not? Well, first what's of all, your, what's, it's your name? A, what's your name? My name is Frederick. Frederick. Um, first of all, um, it's a test and it's, uh, it, it gives you like a probability. Let's say there's a 90% chance that you're like a psychotic, but you're actually one of the 10%. And 
you're you're passed over for the job because of the test. Because of the test, and I don't think that's fair. And you feel threatened in a way. You sound threatened. <laughs> Frederick, no, no, no. I, I usually to, do maybe very good. Something on, happened on, to on you with no, no, no. No, no. <laughs> But and, and the other thing is that it also invites cheating on the test, okay. and yeah, it yeah. invites giving incorrect, insincere answers, and that comes, complicates the whole question. And I think the best psychological test, well, except probably for for asking the the underlings, is the whole political process as well that you have to go through. You're vetted through and through. Yeah. So the experience itself of years and years and years in learning. Um, so I, I wonder, Rob, would it be feasible to organize some sort of an assessment for politicians who claim... Well, it hasn't to be a, a sort of assessment. It has to be a very big, severe assessment. And we have to do it every year. The current, what we do now, what we do now, is there is a name dropping for a minister. Mm -hmm. The minister goes to the new prime minister, and he talks with the new minister for 20 minutes, half an hour. And I know what he is doing. He asks, are you addicted? Sex, drugs, rock and roll. Have you anything to do with the police in your past? And have you a sexual relationship with another woman than your wife? Mm -hmm. That are the three, three questions the new prime minister asks you when you become a minister. And then, That's after it. 20 minutes, you go to the Binnenhof, yeah. and there are a lot of cameras, and I'm the new uh, Minister of Health. Or yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was a general practitioner. My assistant had uh, five days of assessment because they have to talk with anxious patients. They have to, uh, to do a lot of uh, difficult things. So I would say a very big assessment at the beginning, and every year, we look at the changes, okay. the <laughs> testosterone changes. Is it increasing? Okay. <laughs> Is it decreasing? <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm bloody maybe, serious. Maybe we should put... What, yeah, what, what, yeah, okay, okay, let me yeah, give you one serious. example. Let yeah. me give you one example. If we had an assessment two years ago for Henky Blaker. Henky Blaker? Yeah. Henky, it's Henky his, Blaker. His, his, he real, was, name, his he real, was, real name is Henky. I didn't know that. Yeah. But, okay. He was... He was a very normal, very decent person. Mm -hmm. I have seen him chain within one year to a complete idiot. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I remember one cartoon, I will never forget it, it was one of the best cartoons of last year, and Henky Blaker was laying on his young girlfriend, uh, do, uh, uh, they were doing the act, yeah. and, and you saw a balloon coming out of his head, and, he, and the balloon said, if I can do this, I can lead it say the act. <laughs> <laughs> Stine, do you agree with Rolf? <laughs> Is it a, I mean, he's exaggerating, obviously, but some sort of a, a real assessment before starting off as a minister, being a responsible uh, leader. Well, my, my first uh, impulse was to say, no, there are all kinds of problems with these kinds of tests. But then, uh, uh, but then I thought, uh, we have to take it further. Like Rob, this is not enough. Um, as soon as people get a position of power, they change, and your book demonstrates it. Uh, even females change. I don't know. Have, has anybody seen this wonderful Danish television series Borgen, which yes, has been wonderful. called A Study yeah, in yeah, Power? Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, here we have a female prime minister, and as soon as she gets this wonderful position, prime minister, even she is prone to corruption. She changes. So it's not enough to have a psychological test at the beginning. We need. Uh, my suggestion would be not to have tests, but suggestion would be to have psychologists on board on every advisory board oh, yeah. where people are in, in, in positions of power. Uh, we need psychologists uh, in parliament. Um, we need a, a permanent system where there's a checkup, a balance checkup for people in position of power. And I would suggest psychologists there, coaches. Not, not tests, but, but actual psychologists on board of okay. people uh, with power. So we more or less agree then. Well, the audience did not agree, but okay. Let's go to a little test. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Raise your hand, I'll be there. I'll be there. One moment, one moment. Yes. Your, for, your name is? Uh, Luther Lindemann, Eindhoven. Uh, die psychologische test zouden die dan openbaar zijn? Want wat gebeurt er nou als niemand die psychologische test met goed gevolg aflegt? Yeah, that's a good question. Should, yeah, the, um, so this, these psychological tests, uh, should they be put uh, out in public? Huh? Should they be uh, in the media maybe? And what would be the effect if nobody really succeeds in uh, successfully... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ian, you have an idea. Well, just to say that 
these deep motives are largely unconscious. So standard questionnaire tests won't pick it up. Um, you need indirect measures, which are a bit difficult, like taking their language and analyzing them. I'm not saying you should use this method. No. But the best assessment is to get people, a combination of people who understand power, and the problem is we don't have a language for it, talking to people who have been under the power. I also think it would not be a healthy thing to, pop, to put the tests out in public because then nobody will ever again apply for a job <laughs> as a minister because hey, that, that will be the end. Okay, let's do a small test. Um, and I'll explain this to you in Dutch because it, it, it luistert nogal uh, now. De zaal wordt in twee stukken verdeeld. Die meneer daar in het wit, daar bovenin, u hoort tot deze kant van de zaal. Meneer met het jasje, u hoort tot deze kant van de zaal. Is dat helemaal helder voor u? Ja. Oké. Okay. Nu moet u um, een pen, u heeft allemaal een pen als het goed is. Ja, hoop ik. Pen. En een stukje papier. Uh, schrijft u bovenaan een stukje papier. Top. Top, de bovenkant. Top. T-O-P. En e, op, maakt niet uit op de rode of op de groene. Top. Dan, als u dat gedaan heeft, hou dat stukje papier in de hand waarmee u niet schrijft met de pen samen. Gewoon even daar wegstoppen, zal ik maar zeggen. Goed, dat is het. Nee, nu, nu zijn we helemaal klaar ervoor. Deze kant van de zaal, ik vraag u om even heel goed en diep na te denken, terug te gaan naar het moment waarop u over mensen de baas was. Haalt u een, 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 een stukje geschiedenis bij uzelf naar boven, een herinnering dat u heel nadrukkelijk dominant was, uh, mensen misschien wel heeft ontslagen, uh, vertelde wat ze moesten doen, dominant. U was de baas. Gaat u even naar dat moment. Deze kant van de zaal wil ik vragen om naar een moment te gaan waarin u zich um, ge, uh, ja, uh, gedomineerd voelde. U had last van een baas, ik geloof dat velen van u dat net al helemaal herkenden in het staatje van Ian Robertson. Gedomineerd, een baas die je vertelt wat je moet doen, je bent een beetje bang misschien, je gedomineerd. Enfin, ga even, probeer dus nog eventjes een minuutje, beide kanten geef ik een minuut om even naar zo'n moment te gaan en dat heel krachtig bij uzelf op te roepen. En nou moet u goed opletten. Ik wil u vragen, met de hand waarmee u schrijft, om vijf keer hard in uw vingers te knippen. Vervolgens drukt u het papiertje waar u top over hebt gezet op uw voorhoofd. En schrijft u een grote E, een capital I, op dat papiertje. Dus u drukt het papiertje op uw voorhoofd en u schrijft een grote E op het papiertje. Vijf keer knippen. Eén, twee, drie... Vier, vijf, papiertje op je voorhoofd en een grote E. Een hoofdletter E. Dus geen negen of een zes, zie ik sommige mensen tekenen. Ook geen A of een B, maar gewoon een E. Goed, haal dat papiertje maar van uw voorhoofd. Now is the test in? Well, we'll have to see. It's difficult yeah. for me to see, so you yeah. have to okay. you have to check for yourself now. Ian, maybe you can explain yeah, what sure. the result should be. Okay. So there there are two ways you can draw the E. You can draw the E from your perspective, that is like that, as if the E seen from your eyes, or you can draw the E from the other person's perspective, like that. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is, how many of you, and can I just say before we see the results, this is not standard conditions and I'm not expecting this to work. A true scientist, <laughs> don't you worry about a thing, it's just funny and give them a break, come on. <laughs> and this side, how many of you, this, this was the people who had to imagine a time when they had power. Right. <clears throat> how many of you drew the E that was correct from your perspective, from your eyes, put your hands up. So wrong for the other side. Wrong the for the other side, right from your side. Put your hands up, that it was right. And be honest, you. please, okay. come on. Okay, okay. Okay, how many on this side did it that it, was, that it was right from your side? 
Okay. Uh, Statistically uh, significant, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, but it, like, <laughs> so you, you explain the real test. What, what actually happens is that if you think of a power, powerful situation, you forget the other side. So you write the capital yeah. E from your own perspective and you forget that you need to show. Yeah, well, okay. Anyway. <laughs> We're going to the next statement. I'll oh, just, just explain. Uh, yeah, 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 explain, explain. Yeah. Quiet, please, please, attention, yeah. attention. One, I'll take yeah. one minute to explain. One minute to explain. <laughs> Adam, Adam, Adam Galinsky and his colleagues in New York did this experiment in better control conditions. And when people thought of power, power, you are in control and there's less need to take the perspective of the other person into concern. So the Power makes you egocentric, and power makes you lose empathy. This was one of a number of experiments that showed even small amounts of imagined power made people more egocentric, and that's why your boss hmm. becomes focused and insensitive. That's one reason is because his, his whole mental set is, from his point of view, is usually a him and not from other people's point of view. So, okay. Thank you. Let's, um, let's, um, let's, let's, let's look at the next um, statement. We should be more forgiving for our leaders. I'll add to that, they are under enormous pressure and risk job-related psychological side effects such as an elevated sex drive and a loss of the ability to empathize. We should be more understanding of these Challenges and Ian, I have to say in your book, I do find some compassion. Yes, it's true. Huh? Yes, you, 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 yeah. Yeah. being a leader is tough. Being a leader is tough. You have to. It's really tough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They cannot help it. Yeah. They cannot <laughs> help it actually. It's 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 biological. So I wonder, the audience, are you convinced? Are you? Do you agree? We should be more forgiving. Or disagree? That's interesting. This is interesting. Disagree, disagree, disagree. I wonder. No, disagree. Disagree. Yeah, I'm going to check with you. What's your name? Why do you disagree? Uh, What's your name? My name is Rob. Rob? Um, I, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, um, everybody is responsible for their own actions. Yes. And um, even if you are a leader, uh, you're responsible. Yeah. You mustn't forget that. It is lonely at the top. I don't care. You don't care? No. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody has a firm opinion on this? If you want to share. Yes, you want to share? Okay, all the way down there. You are empathic with our leaders. I'll hand you the microphone. I never do this, actually, but for in this specific circumstances. What's your name? Bertine. Bertine. Uh, yes, but because it's so lonely, we should be forgiving, I think. You think we should? Yes, yeah. yeah. Did you ever do it yourself? Were you forgiving to your boss? Who was abusing you in... No. No, no, not in the... No, no, no. He was... No. was but it was well, the you other way around. You understand what I mean. Sorry? Uh, it was the other way around. I forgave him. You forgave him? Yes. You did? Yes. But then you left the company? No. No, you stayed? No. No, no okay. I actually, actually challenged him and then I uh, became his competitor. Good. Yes. Good. Thank you, Bertine. Anybody having any experience in this specific... Ah, I see the hand of Martin Frankenhuis. Yes, 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 yes. The our director of Artis. Thanks. Yes, um, he knows a lot about animals and biology. Uh, so I know also a lot about leaders. Uh, yeah. Obviously, <laughs> yes. Uh, I think we can't blame the leaders because Homo sapiens, which is modern man in fact, used to roam around in bands of 70 to about 125 people mm -hmm. and the leader of such a group could manage 120, mm -hmm. 125 people all together. Uh, this is absolutely the maximum amount of, a maximum number of people that you can, you can lead. You can manage. So yeah. you, you, you can't blame a leader that he can't manage a population of 50 million people. <laughs> okay. okay. Let alone. <laughs> A million. So you're forgiving there? Yeah. Okay, clearly. So let's get back to the... Uh, oh, you want, to, you want to share something? Yes. Your name is? My name is uh, Jindra Marcus. I think we are forgetting something that uh, in some cases 
the world or the nations need crazy leaders. If you look at the American Civil War, most of the generals that were successful were completely crazy and notorious for that and came from, some came from insane institutions. So how do you look at that? Ian, <coughs> we need some psychopaths. I'm not joking, eh? no, I'm no, not no, joking, yeah, yeah, this yeah, yeah, is yeah. true. I mean. This is true, yes, fact. Uh, I think um, if you're going to be a general in a war, the last thing you need is empathy for individual human beings. You have to have that quality of ruthlessness to be able to sacrifice the lives of hundreds, maybe thousands of people. That, unfortunately, that's the, the case with war. So, uh, yes, you need very abnormal people who are, in, who are able uh, or maybe partly trained to take that abnormal human uh, position. That's why I found people's astonishment about Anders Breivik saying he had to be insane. I don't believe he had to be insane. I think he was the general in his own single army. I think, I think human beings can get to a position where they can be apparently insane. And yes, war is an insanity, and you need people who are quite un abnormal to, 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 to run them, usually. Okay. But not in war situations. What about that? Well, I was, think I was thinking of war situations. I'm not, I don't think insanity, frank insanity, you couldn't be a psychotic general because you, you wouldn't have the capacity to do it. But there has to be a degree of a, at least acquired psychopathy in generals. You have to, to be able to quell normal human emotions. And Anders Breivik, if you look at his accounts, trained himself systematically to repress his emotions and, um, and to, 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 that he didn't, would not then feel the compassion for what he was doing because he felt he was the general in an army in doing this. So, so yes, there is a bit, it's not insanity, but it's abnormal states in order to be a general. Stine. Yes, so maybe there are some leaders you would like to forgive and some you wouldn't. Yeah. I, I, when I saw this question, I was thinking of uh, Clinton, Bill Clinton. Yeah. Uh, and he's one of the leaders I, I always felt this, oh my God, he could have been my father effect mm -hmm. with. So, uh, very easily. Uh, yes. So I would, <laughs> you know, that <laughs> it's such a big. He's a biologist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easily, easily, easily. Touchdown. But he could have been your grandfather. But, uh, but he had that, 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 that the Republican trap, the, the media trial was so huge. You, you started to feel sorry for this yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there are more leaders who, who you feel that the trap, uh, the politic, political war, and it is it so. Um, but then again, there are examples where you think, oh my God, they are psychopaths. Why should I forgive Stalin, mm. Lenin, Hitler, you name and, it? And, so and, and, and someone, from the, someone from the audience, Robert was, I guess, he, he phrased it very well. They've decided they wanted to become a leader. Yeah. It's their choice. Come on, yeah. this is not something yeah. which but happens to them. But we choose the leaders we deserve, or perhaps. Mm. We, we get the leaders we deserve. We choose our leaders. At least we do in Holland. Not, well, this is interesting. not in totalitarian no, no, no. regimes. No. But we don't choose them. We don't choose them. The elections next Wednesday, we don't choose our leaders. We don't choose our prime minister. We don't choose our ministers. So I disagree with you. I would say, let's choose them. But even, um, but, but, yeah. even in cities, it's not... Um, we don't choose our elder men, we don't choose um, uh, uh, mayor. 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 Um, well, would this would this would this solve the power problem? <laughs> you speak Dutch. Burgermeister. Well, okay, then can we can all over gaan over Nederlands. Wat een flauwe kul. Als je de hele avond Engels te praten, spreekt hij gewoon Nederlands. Twee bier. Ja, twee bier. Na twee bier. <laughs> so this is really interesting. But why? Why? Turning into um, was it that we, because I always have forgiven Bill Clinton, but why did I do it? Because he <laughs> what, no, and there's nothing to do. Yeah. Oh, that's very easy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense actually. Yeah, yeah it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. But. <laughs> you are mates in a way, eh? you sort of, yeah, you connect. It was far, far before 2004. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, no, but, but, but seriously, um, because he, it was a lie. He said, I did not have sexual intercourse with that woman. So it was not only sexual intercourse, it was a lie. 
No, he said, I did not have <laughs> sex with that woman. I did not have any relation with that woman. No. Okay. Come okay. On. okay. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. That's, Whatever. Yeah. But um, was it because Hillary said, stand by your man? Was it because the American press said, well, he's the most powerful man to, um, well, to raise America to whatever. Why do we forgive Bill Clinton? Why don't well, we forgive but Berlusconi? Gives, but Ian gives an interesting answer in his book because there's a clear comparison between Blair and Clinton, and Clinton is not that power hungry compared to mm. Blair. Mm. He is okay. empathic. Okay. Yes, but your question or remark is more important than mine. Your name is? Yeah, my name is Karen. Um, I think we should be more uh, forgiving on our leaders because in Holland we have very much a culture if somebody is in the lead and he makes a mistake, we chop his head off. Mm -hmm. So it's a big deal for uh, our leaders to not give in to making mistakes because the minute they it's admit the to it, they're gone. And that's why uh, also guys maybe like Clinton uh, uh, keep on saying that they did not have sex with any women or whatever. Uh, uh, long um, past, we, we believe them. Mm -hmm. So I can think that being more em empathic with our leaders can also... Create uh, better leaders. Create empathy back, you, okay. you know, it, it works both ways. So because um, they're allowed to make mistakes, they're allowed to be human, okay. and, and we could have more faith Thank going on both but, ways. But, but then Very again, but then again I'm not forgiving toward Dominique Strauss-Kahn. So I think it does have to do with this power-driven... Uh, uh, it's okay. Let's 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 try and sort of try. We, there's about ten minutes left or so, and I would like to end on a positive note. So, um, <laughs> uh, Ian, you agree with me? Let's look into the future. Our yeah, third yeah. statement. There's only two more to go. So the third statement in the twenty in the twenty first century requires less focus on winning. If you talk about leadership, um, do you agree, actually, Ian, with that statement? Yeah. Well, I think it's. I think we need to win for the collective. I think individualism, extreme individualism, is a problem. Mm -hmm. it, it's largely been fostered in, in American culture, which we've all followed. And I think, I think we need a more communal approach where, and that will take a lot of the stress out of society because individual competitiveness causes an enormous problem in mental health. Yeah, but some people Burnout. also believe you need competition in order to create new things, to be innovative. Yeah, and, 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 and you do, and you do, but we have to train kids to be competitive with themselves and set goals for themselves, but also cooperative. The, 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 the individual competition is um, causing such a, an epidemic of depression and anxiety and burnout that um, I think we, 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 we need to, and, and we will also use less resources of the world if we start to act collectively. Yeah, we need to. there will not be the same competition to have a bigger car or a better this or a better yeah. that. If you look yeah. at the, the big issues we are facing at the moment concerning yeah. energy or food yeah. or, and, and the number of people, oh, there's nine, nine billion of us in, what is it, 10 years time or yeah. so. Rob, do you agree with the statement? No, I don't agree. Um, Let's face the Olympic Games. They always say um, it's very important to be there. It's not important to win. Well, I saw the Olympic Games in London. There is only one thing for all the athletes. I want to win. I want to have the gold medal or the silver or the bronze medal. What's wrong about that? What's wrong about winning? What's wrong about um, people who, who are activating themselves to create new a new position, to create some innovation, to win from the other. To What's beat wrong the about other. that? What's wrong about that? There are wrong things, of course. Yeah. But um, I like winners. Yeah. They have a lot of energy. No, but the, 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 the thought behind this statement is that the focus of winning has brought us many great things in the past. Competition, 20th century. Yeah. But now we are facing such huge problems and we are so connected and interdependent and the globalization is a fact that um, the individual winning, the, the idea of life is a survival of the fittest, either you eat or you're being eaten, that fighting all the time, that it is becoming contra, uh, counterproductive in a way. 
So that we need something new, something else, something which binds us together in order to be able to cooperate and be empathic and trying to yeah, well, use uh, the sources. Yeah, uh, Buma to told us, us uh, that's Buma. a political party, um, uh, and Mona Kaiser, let's do it together. But what is it? Okay, let's okay, do okay. it together. Yeah, okay, you don't what like it, said, yeah, clearly. <laughs> what okay. is it? I'm going to ask Stina, do you agree with the statement? Well, if you look at popular culture these days, from the voice of Holland, idols, the X Factor, it's all about winning. And yeah. um, I think it also trains young ch children that really there are two categories of humankind, winners and losers. And I think that is not, I think that's corruptive. Um, and I think it's corruptive because in the end it will stop thorough thought. Uh, because we will live in an, an idol's culture where you judge. And the judge is a winner or a loser. Uh, so it's a, it's a culture that's driven by, by opinions. Easy evaluation. Look on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You will get uh, immediately you will get the results of the Twitter jury, which is us, the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, so it reduces debates to, towards a winner and a loser. And it, it, it reduces thought in the end. So, yes. But I do believe there's something changes in it, it, it that, that the culture will correct itself also. Because at one point we will be fed up with sterren springen, uh, idols. I mean, there, there will be a point where we... Well. Where the creative, uh, where we will get creative and come up with new but things. It might also I, be important for winners, for winners themselves. I'll quote you from your book, Ian. You explain a winner feels it's in the end of your book, your final yeah. thoughts. It's mm. reflective in a way, almost mm. philosophical, um, a little bit soft even. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I take it. I can take it. Point taken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I quote: A winner feels he, she is in control, but this is not the case. The real winner realizes that ego is a dangerous beast, um, and uh, it's better uh, you, it, it's better you fight the ego, eh? try to get that loose. Yeah. Yes. Be, uh, just if I can say to Rob, silver medal winners at the Olympic Games are unhappier than bronze medal winners. <laughs> unhappier, of course. Unhappier. Number two. Okay. Number it's two. Number two. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing about, apart from the gold medal. The problem with winning is there is always, apart from the Nobel Prizes, Oscars, and gold medals, there is always someone better than you. Yeah. So if, you're, if your motivation is to win, rather than as Albert Einstein's is, he didn't want to win, he just wanted to understand the universe. That was his thing, that the innovation that drove him on. He wasn't caring about, he didn't think about a Nobel Prize or anything like that. No. that that's, that's true winning. That's true, that's intrinsic winning. But wanting to beat others, but in it's your world, in your yeah. world, there's no scientist who actually became a scientist in order to be able to win a Nobel no, Prize. No, no, no. It doesn't no, no. exist, no, does it? No. no. Well, well. Okay. <laughs> Last statement. La okay. First, I want to I want your opinion on this one. If you agree with the statement or not, show me your cards. Well, 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 well. <laughs> no, there's a clear majority. Uh, you came here with the expectations that maybe in the future we would have different sorts of leaders. Winning needs to become less important. Clearly, you made a statement there. Our last statement, um, women, women are better at dealing with power. Firm statement, yeah, that's a firm statement. Women are better at dealing with power. Well, let's first listen to them, right? <laughs> so all the, well, so, yes, yeah, some women already made a very clear, I'm curious. Daphne, Daphne Bunskoek here <laughs> on the front row. We want to learn from her. She was yesterday at uh, Knevel and Van der Brink. And she's presenting this program now, uh, Premier Gezocht. And you were the first one to raise green. Yes, this is a fact. So maybe you can explain to us why. Well, I, I read the book of Ian because I'm going to interview him for Gesprek 2. And um, he's explaining something about S power and P power in the book. Yep. Maybe he could explain it himself, which made it very clear to me. And I think that women are less ego driven so that they use their uh, yeah. power and benefit for society instead of power that benefits themselves yeah. only. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah, I had exactly the same experience. Maybe, Ian, it's important to, to explain the, the S and the P power, the Clinton versus Blair. Uh, yeah. So men and women all have a, a need for power of varying degrees. But there's two, two aspects of that. One is ego, P power, where it's, it's the personal aggrandizement that gets you going. And the other is S power, where you want power, but it's for the, to have an impact for the bettering of other people. So teachers and nurses, for instance, have a high need for power, but it's more of the S power. Everyone has an egotistical P power 
component to it, but people have vary in the, the degree of S power. The more S power motivation you have, and women tend to have more than men, the more you have, the less the biological effects of winning have on you. Your testosterone surges are shorter acting. But maybe you and, can explain yeah. why, I mean, why do women have less of the P power and more of the altruistic, when that's what it is, S power? Uh, are inclined uh, uh, to possess more I, of that yeah. quality? I, the answer is, there could be many answers to that. I don't know which is the correct one. It could be cultural, it could be biological. Men have more testosterone than women. Mm -hmm. uh, men go, seem to push, men seem to sacrifice much more to get power than women do. And that may be a problem for women going to power because having power is horribly stressful. It ages you. Look at Tony Blair and Barack Obama, how they age before your eyes when they get power. So, so, so maybe women are more clever and maybe fewer of them are willing to make that sacrifice. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not certain about this. I think we need more women, but we need more women with an appetite for power who are prepared to engage to go through the aging process that holding power will cause. Okay, I see Rob nodding his head, you agree? Yeah, I agree with it, but uh, just for the discussion, what happened to Margaret Thatcher? Yeah. But um, that's not a real woman, no. I mean biologically <laughs> she's a woman. But oh, she sure. Okay, 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 that's a another woman. woman. That's a man, oh. that's a man oh. 2.0, yeah. okay. she's a better man. <laughs> okay, Angela Merkel? Sorry? Who? Angela Merkel, you know her? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, she could be a good example, maybe, of what you were just explaining. I think she's a good example, yeah. I don't, I don't think she's corrupt. Did you analyze her speeches? No, 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 no she's not corrupt, but, but I saw some changes oh, by wow. her. Um, not equally with men, but... Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The, so I think it's better, but what happens to women when they are under powerful influence during the first... Of after the first five years. Yeah. Stine, what do you guess? What's your guess? I know of h hardly any women who, who have been involved in such sex scandals as men I know in power. Um, Cleopatra, mean, maybe? Uh, Cleopatra? Uh, yeah, <laughs> but like, th uh, like Thatcher, story about Cleopatra like Thatcher they say about Thatcher, she was the only real man in her cabinet. Yeah. Um, usually, <laughs> I mean, she's really the exception. And I, I do believe that if the Lehman brothers would have been Lehman sisters, uh, we would have been... No, but no, wait, wait, so wait, wait, wait. There, 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 no, wait, wait, there has been done extensive research by Joris Lammers from the Tilburg yeah. University, yeah. Yeah. and he shows in this uh, research that both men and women are inclined to, 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 to adultery the moment they become yeah. more powerful. Yeah. Yes, but, but. <laughs> okay, but I do think Ian's book does provide the arguments for, for immediately introducing a 40% quotum in the Netherlands yeah. right now. Yeah, uh, I look agree at with you. look at Norway. Uh, what happened? Uh, they have this quotum, 40% women in power. Uh, they got the rich, richest country in the world now. Mm. I don't know if there's any but what did they do with the money? What did it do with the money? But Norway has... They are so rich and they invested it in pension funds, long-term thinking, mm. no risk-taking, taking care of the elderly, taking care of the future of the children, with 40% women on the board, with Grace Rexton on board on, on the advisory boards. I mean, it does do something to, to, to power balances, and I do believe in healthy organization well, if you have... Let me, let me add to that. Uh, the, the Norwegian example is not very clear to me because the main reason why no Norway is so extremely rich is because they found huge they find oil. amounts of but oil I say, and, what did and, and, and gas. But yeah. I agree yeah, with you that there's been done extensive research by the IMF and the OECD and the British Parliament even, and they asked the question, uh, would the crisis be less severe if we had more women on the boards of our financial institutions? And all those researches, they sh all show in the positive direction where tunnel vision, group think is being uh, uh, broken or avoided simple, simply because you have a more, uh, um, uh, 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 with women in the balanced. board, yeah. more balanced, a diverse team. So I think that makes sense. Uh, le let me have your votes again. Maybe somebody wants may, to add may, something. May I just ask one thing of Rob? Um, imagine President imagine Sarkozy was Angela Merkel, having had, having had the power that she has had over the entire Europe. Would, would, would imagine the changes, or I would ask you, would you have imagined more changes in him than we have seen in her, given the amount of power that Germany has held over Europe for the last... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> um, yeah. I think this would be. Uh, is, is there somebody who wants to make, really wants to make a remark or has a question which has to be answered tonight? Then please raise your hand. Okay, one, or, one and two. That's that's it. Uh, two men in blue shirts. Um, <laughs> so, what's your name? Chaco. Chaco, what's your question or remark? My remark is that maybe Angela Merkel has a good man at home. <laughs> what's a good man at home? What helps her to keep her uh, position in this, uh, in this nice way. Okay. Could be the case, Ian. I I've never ever heard, heard of Mr. Merkel, so I don't know uh, if he's a good man or what he's doing at home or if he's at home <laughs> at all. <laughs> but I've never seen him on pictures, for example, when all the sec... Uh, okay. Um, yes, another blue man. Yeah, so one final question. What can we do not to fall prey to this ego trap? Or do we have to read the book? Um, yes. I, th I think we all have to become Buddhists. That's a clear answer. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, this is a bit of the soft part of Ian. He's a scientist, but he's no. Uh, but I agree with you. Maybe a reflect, reflection. Uh, try to find silence. Half an hour a day, that will do. Yeah. yeah. Make a walk. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have a big hand for Stine Jensen, Robert, uh, Ian Robertson, the great writer. Thank you very much. En dan nog twee dingen. Nog twee dingen. Neem alstublieft even de tijd om te genieten van de expositie hierbuiten. Prachtige foto's gemaakt door Cindy Heijnen. Um, ze heeft een serie gemaakt voor NS Hansblad onder de titel Winnaars. En het interessante van die serie is, uh, ze heeft gekozen, ze heeft mensen opgezocht die iets gewonnen hebben. En heeft ze met die prijs gefotografeerd in een alledaagse omgeving. Waardoor je een heel bijzonder effect krijgt. Prachtige expositie hier in het gebouw. En twee... Vergeet niet het boek te kopen van Ian Robertson. En hij is het klaar. You're ready to sign the books, right? And with personal messages, whatever. You, you, uh, dank u wel. To beer. Thank you very much for joining. Have a nice evening. Ineke has another, yeah, about beer. Ja, dames en heren, ja, ik mag nog een hele blijde mededeling doen. Naast dat ik het ontzettend leuk vond vanavond. En ik hoop jullie allemaal ook een hele leuke sfeer hier en ongedwongen in de Bali. Wordt er ook nog door uitgeverij Maven Publishing een borrel aangeboden. Dus u mag alle een drankje halen bij de bar. Heel erg royaal en hartelijk van de uitgeverij. Om nog even met elkaar na te praten. Ook met de sprekers en met Rob Oudekerk, uh, Stine Jensen en Ian Robertson. Jeroen Smit ook zeer veel dank. Hartelijk applaus en tot aan de bar.